Good morning, good afternoon, evening, depending where you are in the world. Happy Thanksgiving and all of that for those of you in the American contingent. All right, guys. So <clears throat> thanks for joining me today. I know it's kind of a – it's got that sort of holiday feel to it here in the States, that's for sure, and the market's acting the same, a little bit schizophrenic yesterday on the S&P. Um, like always, I highly encourage – uh, questions and participation in this and you know at the end of the day this is for everybody's benefit so fire away with anything you have on your mind and uh, good afternoon good morning everybody so today's um, today's webinar is um, which EMAs this is just a five and a five EMA and a 21 um, <clears throat> Today's webinar is on top-down analysis. What is top-down analysis, how we use it, etc. And I think the best way to demonstrate that is um, by using a bunch of live examples. So that's what I anticipate doing today is basically to run around the charts and see what's what. Because it's a confusing landscape right now. Um, at least I'm... <laughs> You know, I'm a little bit confused on a few things. I'm not gonna lie; it's difficult. I think, I think more than anything, developing a bias that you can feel comfortable with is um, is tough. But we'll talk about that. All right. So, I considered, you know, traditionally top-down analysis has been, uh, you know, you started a weekly chart and you work your way down through the different time frames and you boil it down to what you want to maybe do on a swing basis or a uh, on an intraday basis, et cetera. All right, and that principally is uh, top-down analysis. You know, why do we do that? Um, it's, it's largely so one doesn't get blindsided more than anything. I think that top-down analysis once not only gives you trade ideas, but also keeps you out of trouble um, more than it does actually find you opportunities necessarily. All right, it'd be like uh, you're kayaking down a river and you have no idea that there's a waterfall coming. Um, and you, you know, happy, happy life is but a dream and all of a sudden you hear a noise over the end of the cliff and it's too late. Um, you know, so top-down analysis will prevent you from going over the cliff. All right, so, you know, why... Do we first things first for me when um, let me try to find a clean piece of paper here and we'll talk about a process. All right. So this is how I do this is how I do my analysis. All right. Number one is I like to think of I like to think of a bias. Okay. What affects this bias? And I'm talking about you know, one doesn't necessarily – when I think about bias, I'm thinking about a longer-term bias. In other words, do I think that in – you know, do I think that over a one-year period, the pound will weaken or strengthen relative to the dollar from today? Do I think in a year or – do I think in a year or, you know, six months to a year, the euro will be above where it is now or below it? All right, something as generic as that. You know, what do I think of the yen? Well, they're printing money. The U.S. is talking about raising rates, talking about raising rates. Um, you know, stock market getting pushed up is not exactly yen, not exactly positive for the yen. What do I think? You know, so in other words, I'm asking myself these fundamentally based questions. All right, so number one for me is bias. And even if I'm planning on trading something intraday, to me there's no more valuable thing than having a bias because if you are wrong intraday, it's very difficult when you're trading against your bias to have any kind of faith in it to let it go a little bit. I don't know how you feel about that. So for me, bias is, one, it's just sort of sound. Um, it's a sound principle to have in your trading. But two, it's as much a psychology thing as it is anything else. 
And you and I both know that trader psych is as important as any mechanics that you have in your trading, if not more so. All right. So number one for me is a bias. Number two then is time of day, time of day, and what's happened with the prior session. Okay. In other words. In other words, yesterday's S&P action, it was down in Europe. Then it bounced a little bit of support to begin the day in New York. Okay, so New York AM, we kind of bounced a little bit and then pushed down. And then the New York, you know, the session, the day's definitely broken up New York PM. It rallied. And then it, um, and then it kind of pushed up a little bit in Asia as well, a little bit, and into Europe as well as we started to get some rumors about the ECB, started to get some rumors about the ECB cutting rates and adding additional stimulus. That's awkward. All right, so you kind of got this effect. So you know, my point being is this. The oldest trick in the book in trading is a buy low, sell high situation, isn't it? And that might mean buy low, sell high on a monthly. That might mean buy low, sell high on a daily or a, you know intra-week standpoint. Or it might mean buy low and sell high on a uh, on a very short-term basis. We'll talk about entry points here in a sec. All right. My point being though is this: if you have had two up sessions chances are you're going to have a down session. Said differently, if the market has sold off into the New York close, chances are you're going to have a 30% additional move in Asia. And then Europe, you might see a bit of a transitional session and then New York might buy it up. So in other words, my general, and this is such a generic rule, is two sessions down, one session up. Or two sessions up, one session down, obviously within the context of the overall trend. Okay, and I'm using that very, very loosely um, because it's a case-by-case -case basis, but that's always sort of subliminally in my head. All right? And that's irrespective of longer-term trend. And it's particularly evident you see in the stock market these days, you know, especially since the S&P has basically done nothing. I mean, it's yes, it stayed between 21 and sort of 19 hundo, um, but it's effectively done nothing in 18 months to two years. So it's, you know, you're getting session by session moves that are probably more important than the overall trend until one is established. Okay, so think about where you are in terms of time of day. And that'll give you a general sentiment for that day. All right, and a lot of that is an experience, at, you know, an, an experience assertion more than anything. Right, number three then for me, and I'm just going down here. Those of you walk in early, um, I watch. Um, good question. What markets do I watch? Obviously, the currency markets, the majors, uh, a couple of uh, commodity pairs. You know, Mexican peso, the South African rand, just because I have a vested interest. Um, the Norwegian krona, you know, the SEC, that kind of thing. So I'll watch a few of those just because they're oil-related as much as anything. And then I'll watch nat gas, copper, platinum, silver, gold, um, the S&P 500 a lot, and the DAX. <clears throat> and that's pretty much my bag, and then anything else of... Anything else that peaks interest, um, you know, during the day. But the interesting thing, uh, the interesting thing about the currency market as it relates to, and then obviously I watch yields in the tenure and stuff like that because that's obviously uh, that tail will wag the dog. All right, and it's interesting in the currency market that even though the currency market is fantastically a bazillion times bigger than the stock exchange, uh, equity markets still drive the currency market in many respects. 
all right, on a on a noticeable basis. You know, currency markets may drive equity markets on the longer term, but on a you know the eye and smell test tells you that the stock market drives the currency market. So if you're trading currencies, you certainly want to be watching the stock market and getting feel for that. In fact, the very first thing that I do um, to begin the day is look at an S&P 500 chart and get a feel for what the S&P are wanting to do. Um, you know, up until um, up until recently, Euro strength meant some S&P 500 down. And a lot of that was just because the euro has become a major funding currency and there's all kinds of repatriation flows and that gave the euro some strength when the stock market started to come down. So you could almost trade that as a viable opportunity. You know, stock market starts to fall hard. If you're getting a lagging effect out of the euro, you start to, you know, you might look to get along the euro as such. So there's opportunities like that, but you, that's one of those things where you have to be in front of the computer a lot to notice those correlations as they develop. All right, so going through my little analysis process here, so bias, time of day, session, and then um, I'll start with intraday S&P charts. You know, I'm using S&P stock market in general. S&P intra. Intra. Day. and then expanding out to a weekly, maybe even a monthly, and then bring it back to the intraday stuff, all right? And that's my cycle with all these things. And then after that, we go to the euro and the other majors. Oops. All right, so euro and the pound. I like to look at the euro pound for the pound because I think the pound, it's interesting. You know, you wonder how the euro trading at 70 cents relative to the pound is affecting Europe a little bit. And the, the thing to consider as well is all this dollar strength is as good as a rate hike. You know, now you, I mean, you already got a bunch of commodity currencies starting to raise rates just to try and protect the currency. It's interesting. We'll be living. Anyway, so Euro, the majors here, and then obviously I'll go intraday out to weekly and then circle back again. All right, so let me give you an example of that. Let's pick up, you guys know I love some Aussie action. All right, let's. You know what? We'll do the difficult one, and then we'll. Um, no, I'm changing my mind for the third time. Let's look at the Australian dollar, and we'll then circle back to the S and P's. All right. So here's an Aussie dollar. What has it done? You know, here's a 15-minute chart. Obviously, Europe down from 70 to 80. And it's basically been a down day. I have a line written on my chart at 72.30. And I have a daily central pivot at 72.32. So just those two, those two visual things, I'm noticing that it's a decent amount of support. All right. When you are trade planning, your analysis is information gathering. So you're not actually saying it, you're not actually developing a plan yet. You're just gathering information. All right? So we can take all these moving averages. Get rid of this 21 here. It makes a difference to me. Throws some people off. All right? So here, I'll, just, I'll leave the five on for good measure. But it's been a generally down day. You know, so looking at this, the information at hand would tell me that it's probably going to be some people willing to sell it through. Yeah, why? Well, it's visual support, and it's 72 and a half roughly psych level, whatever. All right, once again, it's not a trade plan. It's just information, but we know that this is likely to be, you know, resistance at least down to the double bottom. I need 20 pips. Right, information, nothing more than that. Okay, then I'll just flick through an hourly and get a feel for it, and a four hour, get a feel for it, 
and we'll go then to a daily chart. Now, this is, I like to study this. Okay. What is our Aussie bias? If I said to you, if I said to you, and participation there would be great, you know, try and commit to something, and there's a right and wrong answer. If I said to you, what is your, where would you expect Aussie to be in a month? Put a one month, a six month, and a 12 year. Where would we expect the Aussie dollar to be in a month from now? Can even be a range. And this is a fundamental decision. You know, is there, where is the Aussie? They've told us, the Reserve Bank of Australia has told us they're probably going to hold rates. It blew it out the box on the last non farm uh, on the last employment data. I don't know if you guys followed that. I mean, like, blew it out the box. They're expecting, like, 5,000 jobs. I think they created, like, 50,000. All right. I don't think China is as bad as everybody says. To me, Aussie is a blue chip. So, 75, it's pretty reasonable. You know, I think, um, I think as, as a range, I don't think it's going to change massively in a month. You know what I mean? I think, sort of, we can expect 72 to 75. You know, this is just the way I see it. I, it is interesting, though. I, I think we could see one last little drop on the RP, but anyway. Right, six month plan. Yeah, I don't know, seventy eight to eighty one. I'm overall an Aussie bull. Alright, twelve month plan. I think it could be right there around seventy eight still. Maybe eighty. Alright. So overall, that's not rampantly bullish, but I would call that neutral to bullish. All right, and this is not only you and I know that this isn't just contingent. I know this is a bit dry, guys, but this is what I'm trying to do is give you some insight as to what goes through the brain on a daily basis. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we can make turkey and tryptophan jokes at towards the end, but let's try to stay on track. Um, so. You know what's going on there. It's it's the uh, I I could go along with that. That's why I said this this for me could be like sixty seven too because you know in in short this is what's going on. We basically got a continuation pattern at support. You know and most of the time you get this kind of thing. Oh hello no. You know so. It's the the time horizon here makes it tricky because you know it could be right back to where it started from after dipping down there. The bottom line is that's kind of what I'm looking at, you know. <clears throat> but let me just go back to this thought process here. Is you know the Aussie is the Aussie is one of those where. Are they in a pause mode? Are they going to cut rates further? We don't have any... They haven't given us any clue to that, and there's no glaring... Uh, there's no glaring numbers coming out of Australia saying, hey, there's a massive problem here. All right? I do think that they're going to... There has to be a little bit of an adjustment in the housing market. Things are just way too hot. But the RBA is not telling us, hey, we're slashing interest rates until the cows come home and adding stimulus like the ECB is. All right, the U.S. the Fed are saying yes, we're going to raise rates, and the CME has put their, you know, it's at twenty seventy two percent now, I think. Uh, if you the last minutes of the FOMC were kind of dovish, they were like, no, we haven't. And I, I'm getting a little bit fed up with the Fed, to be fair. I mean, it's all the vacillating is preposterous, and I think what they'll do is they'll raise twenty five in December. Just if nothing else to save face, but we're going to be stuck for a long time, you know. This rate thing is going to be so gradual; it's going to be like pulling teeth. So I think that in mind, even though the U.S. is hawkish in, you know, quote unquote, I think 
it's going to be such a gradual rate hike that there's still interest rate differential with the Aussie that overall it leaves the Aussie neutral to marginally bullish for now. You know, if you get me, if you ask me, where's the Aussie in five years? Yeah, 95 to a buck. Um, the Australians are on it progressively um, as a nation. All right, now, let's go to the weekly on this. Ken, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, this is what I was talking about with Kevin just a minute ago. Is there's no question that there's support here, and then below it as well, which is interesting. All right, and support. Now, if we take a fib of the entire rise, The Aussie is trading effectively at a 70% discount from where it was. Now, 110 was ridiculous. So let's say that reasonably a dollar was pretty close to where it needed to be at the time. But it's now 70% lower from where it was. Okay, that's a lot. If I look at the weekly, you've got what is a very subtle sort of weekly change of trend here. A little higher low, higher high, higher low scenario. Okay? But commodities in general have not gained a ton of traction, have they? So I think it's reasonable. I think it's reasonable that we see sort of something like this. And this is just a pattern that, you know, when one gets to know over time. All right, it's this one. If price is in a downtrend and you come back, and you get this sort of continuation in the context of the downtrend. You know, a lot of times we get this sort of thing. Continuation. All right. However, you get this pattern a lot too, where you get this sort of thing going on. And then you get... The continuation without a retracement, say. But then you have support underneath it like this. Okay, maybe you have this scenario there like that. This has a much better option one, has a much better option for continuation. However, option two generally does this. It will break to the high side, and what that does is take you into the sell zone of the drop. You know, that takes you into the little sell zone of this swing. Then price breaks all the way through it, says hi, you know, ropes in a bunch of people trying to get short, and then breaks their face off going the other way. See it all the time. And I think that we are in this option number two here. Now, given my neutral to bullish bias, I don't have an interest in buying it. I mean, check that, shorting it. So, you know, I'm thinking it's going to do a little something like this. David, that's a good 600 pips. Yeah, but it's against my bias, so I just, not an, I don't just sit on the sideline and wait. And my strategy here is to wait for longs through this area. And it's that simple. My first one's waiting at 70, 80. Okay, now the other thing to consider is this. What happens if, you know, this is the red zone, my short zone of this last swing drop? What happens if it comprehensively breaks that and I'm set, I'm left waiting? Well, then it's going to be, I'm going to play the long game on it. You know, at that point, I'm going to have to see sort of something like this, you know, to try to get long. How do I know it's probably going to do that? Well, because this is the top-down analysis standpoint. All kinds of stuff through the 79. All kinds of stuff through here. You know, it's the same token as you can't... There's no ways you can tell me you can get long into that and feel good about it. You know, however... You know, getting long through here does feel good. 
And if I was a bear, I would be looking to get short through here. You know, trading can be this simple and this complicated, guys. Have you ever boiled it down like that? You know, I know a lot of you go monthly chart. You've taken leave of your senses, Pegler. Well, I mean, tell me that you're not going to see buyers here. I mean, you just are. And you're going to see people winning the short? Yes. You know, what's it going to look like on a daily? Well, it's going to look convoluted as can be. You know, on a daily, it's going to come down, bounce off it, bounce through itself, come up all the way down to the bottom again. Your mind's going to be, you know, blown about about how, what's it doing? Is it going to go lower? What does it matter? It, you can just see, you know, then you go back to this chart and you have effectively, you know, that's two months worth of information and all it's done is this. Right? That is the beauty of top-down analysis. The thing that's the hardest to grasp about all of this is conceptualizing the amount of time involved. It is months and months and months and months and months. All right? A fundamental bias takes years to change. That's the interesting thing. When it changes, it changes fast. I'm talking technically and price-wise. But... To actually roll that puppy over takes years and a long neutral period and a long period of, you know, and that's, I think we're in the clutches of that on the pound, especially. But I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a minute. All right. You know, once I've got, so, you know, going back to my idea here, I've got sort of something like this in mind. You know, and then kind of up to here and be neutral for a while. And if you remember, our six-month bias was sort of the 75 to 78 area, and that would, you know, and that would probably give us what we expect on the bias side. All right? So, you know, once I've got that general plan together, now start looking at a four-hour. You know, what would a four-hour look like? Okay. You know, I'm sure a lot of people are watching this sort of thing, something like this, I don't know. You know, the bottom line is, you can just tell that this is resistance, is it not? Right, you can just see it visually. And obviously in this context, you've got lots of support now that's developed through this 71 and change area. Okay, and then the next level is obviously here. You know, how does one come up with these levels? You just look at the chart. You know, why is it struggling here? Well, okay. Seems like a lot of junk there. Okay. One doesn't just pull these areas. So what do you think is likely to happen in the con so our weekly is telling us our weekly is telling us we've got this going on. Right now. Something that looks like that. And our analysis is saying, hey, we're probably going to do this. You know, so at the moment, at the moment, we are effectively here. You know, so what's that going to look like on a four hour? Well, hypothetically, the day was down. We've got four hour stochastics rolling over. It's coming off this resistance zone. So chances are we're going to come down to the next sort of level of support. So how about sort of something like this, a hiccup, down to the support, up to the major red zone, and then the short squeeze before it recovers. Okay, it's just a mental note. Now, because of my bias, I have no interest in participating in any of this. However, when and if it gets here, I'm very interested. Why? Because it's my bias. Okay, and a lot of times, even if you're patient and wait for the trade to fall into your bias or fall into your buy or sell zone relative to what your bias is, you're going to be fine anyway. You'll feel good about it, if nothing else. And trust me, that has value. I didn't see what oil inventories were. 0.96 versus a million. 
pretty close to you. Gasoline inventories, 2.4 million over 0.5 expected. Whoa. Goodness. All right. You know, and then we can boil this down to an hourly. Hourly is down. You can see the four hours rolling over. Tiny bit of divergence there to be expected. You know, this is a fib of the rise, but because it's coming off so much resistance, I would expect it to drop to more a fib of this rise. So something along these lines. You know, something like that would be my expectation. And if you're an intraday bull on this, I see no reason why you shouldn't start thinking about longs between sort of 71, 6, 71, 70, 71, 40 range. Trying to make yourselves 100 pips out of that. All right. Does this make sense? I... Does this make any semblance of sense so far? Bias? Correlation? Lower time frame and session sort of stuff, all the way up to daily, going through to the weekly, and then boiling it back. Right, so let me, uh, all right, so let me see two questions. Euro and Swiss, you had interesting spots now, spawn resistance respectively. Can you have a look? Absolutely. And then how does that relate to the S&Ps? Okay. Good questions there. All right. So, let's look at a euro for a minute. All right, and if you're looking at the euro, you know, if you're looking at a euro, obviously a dollar index becomes interesting too. See, here's the thing about the euro right now is this. I'm not sure how many of you are looking at this. It's the fourth test of it after making a lower high. Now, the euro is starting to get to that point where it's going to start to become a problem. You know what I mean? Or said differently, the dollar strength is going to start to become a problem. And if you look at something like, uh, I want to get to the S&P, so maybe we'll jog there and then come back to this euro. But, you know, here's a euro-pound situation. And if we grab a fib from the major high, I mean, we are talking... 75% from where it was. Admittedly, that's, you know, back in 2006. But you've got to feel, you got to feel that sort of into this range, into this range, it's starting to become an issue, you know, in terms of trade. And central banks have a way of having closed-door meetings where they have conversations with each other. And I'm willing to suggest that, you know, you get sort of something like this. You go, huh. Mm. You know? Yeah, it's a big deal. So why am I mentioning this? It does look for all the money, though, that this lower high, little double top lower high there, will push us into the sort of late 60s zone. I'm mentioning it because this is probably going to be a good timing mechanism for the euro. In terms of, hey, I should really start thinking about, you know, is the euro... One, it's a good trade in my opinion. You know, this is it's a pretty low risk situation here with a little bit of daily timing on your side. You know, you're talking about 66 to 73 in normal pips. That's better part of a thousand. Not bad. You know, maybe you, you know, you just keep in mind you you're more value per pip, so manage your risk accordingly. But 
uh, pretty low risk situation to make quite a lot of money there. Long time though, it's going to take a long, long time. You know, here's your weekly, and this is this looks like what I'm trying to say is, despite euro being at the trend line, and despite the fact that I think it's going to go back to 107.80 or so, I don't. I'm not sustainably bullish. You know, I think it's likely to get this. So while this is happening, euro is free to retrace. Um, but I don't think it's sustainably bullish yet, despite the trend line. I'll show you what I mean. You know, here's this big euro trend line. It, you're right. It's a very interesting area. Certainly. You know, so what's reasonable expectation? Yeah, here's a weekly... Reverting to a daily for a second. You know, I think it is reasonable to expect this. <coughs> you know, a fight here. Oh no. Oh wait. Okay. And this is for a few reasons. One, that euro pound. Okay, so, you know, I am expecting a 105, 10480 move to 108. Not bad. You can make money out of that. And then a push down towards the 102, 103 handle. And then I think that that's probably going to be, you know, pretty close to the lows on the euro for the next five to ten years, frankly. You know, I am, I, I believe in, <laughs> I might be the only one to believe in Europe, but I believe in Europe coming back from the ashes over there. And I think that, I think that, you know, I think that owning Euro around 10, you know, 99 to 102, you're going to look pretty good in five years, less. I think, yeah, I think like 101, 102, you know. It's the same as Aussie, you know, if, if I, if, if your friends came to you and said, man, I really want to own some Aussie, you would say, dude, if you picked up Aussie at, if you picked up Aussie at 67 to 71, and we had this conversation again in five years, you know, Turkey's on you, bro, because you're going to make some money. I think the Euro is the same sort of thing. I also believe that the pound will the pound will be the star performer of 2016 initially. Right. It's a long way. I mean, things are things aren't great though, Kev. You know what I mean? It's going to take some time. And your Aussies, your Aussies is going to continue down, I believe, for a little while. Yeah, you know, World War. Th <sighs> I mean, I think that commodities will be, Sanjay, commodities are going to be the thing to own at that point, I would think. It, guys, I am, it, it's, I'm self-admittedly here in a situation, let me look at the S&P very quickly here. I'm in a situation where we are transitional on a lot of these markets. And it's not easy. I don't know about you, but I'm having a difficult time, like, I'm having a difficult time just, and this, typically I can see the, the vision fairly clearly, but I know what I want to do, but I'm really waiting. I mean, the euro, uh, let me show you here. You know, here's a dollar index chart, which is 60% euro, keep in mind. You know, if we zoom out here. <clears throat> this, this to me looks like, you know, a break into resistance scenario. You know, you kind of, oh, hello, all right, pick up the pick up the support again and have another go. I think gold's dead for a while. I think oil's dead for a while. You know, oil, I would expect 45 to 60 for a long, long, long time. Just because of the way the, just because of the way the fracking thing now is in the U.S. Uh, it just takes, you know, the, the fracking guys can produce so much oil so quickly and turn off supply so quickly, and then there's lag effect from the m lag effect from the drillers. The drillers can't turn off supply, so now it's, you get these constant sort of six-month gluts of supply. 
I don't see that going anywhere. You know, so this would this on the euro would translate to sort of something like this on the euro, wouldn't it? Hello, one oh four. You know, back to like one ten, one eleven, right back to the bottom again. You know, this, this here, would effectively be this move here on the dollar index. I did not subscribe to the World War thing either, by the way. I don't. I think we're a long way from that. All right, let's talk about this S and P situation, which is as vexing as anything else on this going on right now. All right, so here is. <coughs> Excuse me. We were in this channel. The Fed came out and very specifically said we're probably going to raise rates in December. I was expecting 1750 and trading for it. You know, I was looking for sort of something like this, push down, back up, a retest of that, consolidation, a false break, and then kind of ticks up here when people realize how slow the rates are coming in. Okay, not to be. <laughs> Wrong. Fail. So as a result, heavily short three year. And wanting to cry in my blankie every day. Okay. It is worth noting though that this is still down here on the monthly stochastic. So I need to do a stochastic lesson more than anything, but What is telling us going, what is the situation on the weekly? The situation on the weekly is it has bounced off support, although I thought it was going to go lower. It has bounced off support here. It has made a higher high. It's now used that higher high as support. To be fair, things are not looking so good on the technical short side. Fundamentally, I'm bearish. The Fed's about to raise interest rates on a slowing economy. I mean, you want to talk about the double hammer. You know, they're going to go, right, we need to raise interest rates because grandma needs to keep her job. She raises rates, and then it's going to be slower than pond water. And, you know, it's, all the barbacks and things are going to start dwindling. I don't know. And in my mind, this is still a scenario that needs to, you know, for it to go up sustainably, we need to sort of see something like this. Okay, so from a fundamental standpoint and just a reasonable, you know, reasonable human standpoint, there, there has to just be some pain here. Now, the question for me, rather, is... And this relates back to the yen, and I've got two minutes, is are we going to see a higher high first? And that is scary, if you're short. <laughs> and for all intents and purposes, it really does look that way. It really looks like we in a sort of this scenario. Got to be honest. You know? So we have to use this. We have to use this move to jump ship as much as possible, wait for it to rise, and then try and short a break of the higher high, basically. Okay, now, that's interesting as a currency trader. Well, one, you probably want to make money out of that. Two is this puppy. You know, correlation's decent here on the yen. Not brilliant, but decent. That's how... It, you know, you got support three and things. But this is as vertical as any move can be. You know, even the even the crazy drop in the crash was more sustainable in terms of how it stepped down than this move. You know? Now have we seen it before? Yes. You know, if you measure this sorry, I'm gonna wrap this webinar up here so I've been rambling. If you measure this distance to this twenty one EMA We'll see that this tends to repeat itself. Okay. 
you know, tens. This one here is a little bit higher, not by much, but get these repetitious sort of distances before the pullback. Oops, I just took away that measurement. You know, where are we here? Like a 125 to 126 situation. And then I think you do for a move all the way down here. You know, so if anything, my S&P slash yen plan is shorting through the 126 to 128 area, looking for about 110. That's a big move. Wayne's still around. I, I don't. I, I talked to Rob mostly about rugby, um, but I know he's still trading. And then Kurt, I've lost track of. Guys, I hope that you learned something here. I feel like it was a bit of a whirlwind. Um, we seem to try and ram as much as we can into uh, into these sessions. But those of you in the States, have a fantastic Turkey Day. I hope that you know, everybody uh, have a happy day of gluttony and have a good nap on that trip to fan situation. And uh, if you need to reach me, at forexdavid, F-O-R-E-X, David, um, or my email c 5 david pegler at yahoo.com um, you know, if you have any questions. Thanks, guys. Thanks, FX Street, and we'll see you for a Christmas edition next month.